And now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Mr. Ken Wallingford. But before I call him up here, I think a lot of you all know him as one of our fellow co-workers, but his, uh, his story is such that I think I couldn't do it justice without actually reading to you a proper introduction, so if you'll indulge me. Mr. Wallingford entered the U.S. Army in 1969 and completed basic and advanced training at Fort Polk, Louisiana. He completed paratrooper school at Fort Benning, Georgia, and attended Special Forces Phase I training at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Sent to Vietnam in August 1970, Mr. Wallingford was assigned as a sniper with the 25th Infantry Division. One year later, he volunteered for a second tour of duty as a military advisor with the Military Assistance Command Vietnam. While advising 200 South Vietnamese troops on August 5, 1972 at Loc Ninh, South Vietnam, he and four other Americans came under heavy mortar and artillery fire from three divisions, which is about 30,000 troops, of North Vietnamese and Viet Cong soldiers. After two and one half days of oppressive and massive fighting, the numerically superior enemy overran his camp. Severely wounded, he was one of three survivors taken prisoner six days before his scheduled discharge. Imprisoned in the jungles of Cambodia in a five foot by six foot tiger cage for over 10 months, he was repatriated on February 12, 1973. He was one of the first two Texans to return home following a signing of the Paris Peace Agreement. His military awards and decorations include the Silver Star, the Bronze Star, two Purple Hearts, the Prisoner of War Medal, and 12 other medals and unit citations. And as you know, he currently works as a veteran liaison for the Texas Veterans Land Board, where he has served his fellow veterans for over 25 years. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Ken Wallingford. Thank you, James. Boy, this is a crowd. Does this count for uh, training requirement, uh, Commissioner? <laughs> Mandatory? The smoking lamp is with us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, James, for that kind introduction. Mr. Overton, it's a true honor to be in your presence, sir. Thank you so much for your service to our country and to our great state of Texas. Thank you for being here today. My fellow veterans, in the agency there are 64 of us, men and women, that serve this great agency, the Veterans Land Board and the General Land Office. In Texas, we are the second largest veteran populated state at 1.7 million. In the United States, there's over 22 million veterans living today and I'm excited to say that 1.2 million are women. Veterans Day is a time to honor not just those who have fought for us in battle, but in fact, all of the outstanding men and women who have served in our nation's armed forces. For all veterans, regardless of their service and the era in which they served, they paid the price time and time again. They have defended America through both the best and worst of times, and they have performed their duties tirelessly with little recognition or fanfare. It was simply a love of America and the freedoms that we all cherish. As I reflect upon my military service, I wanted to share with you briefly, I'm on, I'm on the internet, but I won't bore you with a lot of details, but. Uh, my experiences uh, serving in Vietnam, and can I have a show of hands? I don't think we have anybody working for us here today that's World War II, do we? Except for Mr. Overton, of course. Uh, Vietnam, how many Vietnam? Korea, Persian Gulf, post-desert uh, storm, peacetime. You know, Vietnam, as so many people have heard about and learned about, uh, was kind of a controversial war. It literally divided our country. You know, we still had the draft going on back then, and a lot of us volunteered to serve because we felt it was the right thing to do. And so as James mentioned in part of my bio uh, introduction, you know, I went to Vietnam not knowing what was going to happen. You know, you get through all the training, you get through all the you know, knowledge and so forth that you can gain here in the United States, then you're sent to a faraway country, in this case, Vietnam. But I went to Vietnam irregardless of whether it was right or wrong, I felt it was my obligation as an American citizen 
to serve our country when duty calls. Not everyone during that era agreed with that and left and went to other countries. But I still say this today, right, wrong, or indifferent, and even today, and what we've been through the last 10, 12 years overseas, you know, because see, there's no draft anymore. Every man and woman serving in our military today in faraway countries that we may disagree whether we have a need to be there, voluntarily served, and in some cases have served six and seven tours of duty, which is unfathomable in my mind. But when I went to Vietnam, you know, not knowing what to expect, let me see if this thing works. Yeah. Uh, you know, my first tour of duty, you know, I was assigned as a sniper on a sniper team as James Head. And when I've talked to school kids and talked about my experiences, I said, killing is never right. But sometimes you have to do that because that's the mission. And so, you know, on a sniper team, you know, it's a little different than being in a leg unit. Of course, I was Army. My dad was Air Force. My dad always wanted to know why I went in the Army uh, instead of the Air Force. Said I wanted something solid under my feet instead of, you know, flying in the air and being a sitting target. But when I went there and I said, okay, I'm going to be on a sniper team. And you go in a operation. It becomes second nature to you. you get back on it's not working? Okay. But it becomes a way of life. When you see an enemy crossing the road with a bush tied behind his back, and you squeeze that trigger and see him drop in the middle of the road. But as long as we had been in Vietnam, as many lives, 58,000 lives that were lost, how many people served over three million in Vietnam, you say, you know, am I doing the right thing? You never question it because duty called, duty served. This is a great country. And so fortunately, I survived that first tour of duty. And some of you that in Vietnam, you know, I was getting kind of short. And uh, I decided to volunteer for a second tour of duty because back then I could get out. All I would do is do another seven months and I could get out nine months early. And being reared in the military and being in the Army, I said, okay, at some point, Ken, you've got to get a life and get on with reality. And so when I went back, I went back as a military advisor, advising South Vietnamese soldiers. And when we entered Vietnam in the late 1950s as an advisor to the locals over there, it was strictly an advisory capacity. In 61, 63, we kind of ramped up and started introducing ground forces and so forth, and uh, Vietnam kind of took off, if you will, as a full-scale war, even though Congress never declared it. But I thought, hey, if people are dying, I don't know what more constitutes a war than somebody being shot and killed. But our leaders at that time said no. So... I was getting within about a week's time, 10 days of my time of being able to get out of the military. I was up north of Saigon, about 75 miles north of Saigon, which today is called Ho Chi Minh City. It will always be Saigon. Uh, myself, four of the Americans, and about 200 South Vietnamese soldiers. And woke up one morning at 6 o'clock in the morning. And I can remember going outside the little train that we had in our little base camp, and I saw a colonel out there in his hammock. And I just didn't connect at that time why he was up so early. So I went back to my, uh, where I was sleeping. About an hour later, we heard this little thumping sounds coming into our compound. And, David, are you rolling that thing? All right, we'll get to that in a minute. And so mortar rounds, artillery rounds started coming in our compound, and about an hour or two later, we figured out, keep in mind, there's 200 South Vietnamese soldiers, five Americans. We had been hit with 30,000 North Vietnamese soldiers and Viet Cong soldiers that were there to go to Saigon. We just happened to be in the way because we were 75 miles of, uh, north of Saigon. And so we called in the Air Force out of Udon Air Force Base in Thailand, 7th Air Force, to provide air support. We knew it was going to be extremely difficult to get out of there alive because there was just more of them than there was of us. But the Air Force did a phenomenal job, and we would not allow any aircraft helicopters to land to try and get us out of there because it was just too hot of an area. 
And so as myself and the major were separated from the command post, and the third morning, now we had gone without any sleep, food, or water. And it's amazing what the body can do in a situation where you have no other options. And so that morning of April the 7th, 1972, I told the major, because we lost communication with the uh, command post, I said, you stay here, and I'm going to go out and kind of survey the situation. Because at that time, we were literally being overrun with Russian tanks and North Vietnamese and Viet Cong soldiers. So I wanted to assess the situation as best I could, go back, and let's go ahead, let's go find a hiding place. Got between two buildings and a wall of sandbags. And the next thing I felt was an explosion going off, and half my head had been blown away. And as I was lying there wounded, thinking this was it, Later on, 17 shrapnel wounds, different parts of my body. And I just started praying. I said, Lord, you know, because I went to Vietnam as a non-believer. And if you've ever heard the adage that there's no atheists in foxholes, battlefield conversions, I am one of those. Because I had everything at my disposal, but it wasn't enough to get those guys out of there and to get us to freedom. So by some means, and I don't know how much time passed, you know, we went back in the command post. In fact, let me say this, because sometimes you said this in the, <laughs> in the past. Bill McLemore has been a longtime friend of mine for 25 years. Bill's also the new deputy commissioner for the Veterans Land Board. That camp where I was, Bill, special forces people built that five years earlier. And he likes to joke about, well, can't we help it? I said, yeah, but you didn't have 30,000 guys at you either. <laughs> but anyway, so he you know, got in there, got on the radio. I told the major, I'm a sergeant, so I'm you know, telling the major what to do, which sergeants don't normally do. But this guy was artillery, so anyway. <laughs> I said, put everything you got around us. Get these guys off of here. Get out of here. We went into another hiding place that, uh, that evening. They came back in the next day, started pouring gasoline on top of the position. They went through systematically through the camp we were at uh, looking for us and started smelling gasoline. And if you know what that smells like or what's next, Molotov cocktail. And so we exited through the portholes. And this picture behind me, I'm there in the center. They came. And I can remember walking out of that compound that day. Now, here I am six days before I'm supposed to get out of the military. And, of course, they come down upon us, myself and the major, and take all our weapons off of us and personal belongings except for our clothing and uh, tied us up with combo wire. They took us outside this camp where we were into this tree line. And that picture behind me is right after I was captured. And I'm the one in the center with the arm in the sling. And that picture was actually taken by one of the North Vietnamese soldiers. It's on display in a museum that is there at Loch Ninh and was sent to me later on through some channels and so forth. And so to collapse some time frames, and if we've got some time, we'll have a Q&A, or you know, I'm going to let James kind of direct uh, how, we, how we should do this thing. You know, they took us and tied us up, and I didn't know at that point what happened to the other three Americans in the, camp, in the, in the command bunker. And so later that night, after we had to walk about 10 hours, and at this point I've got, I've counted best I could, 10 shrapnel wounds in my legs, and the major's having to help me. And so that night we linked up with the lone survivor of the command post, three Americans. Our colonel was killed, the master sergeant was killed, Captain Mark Smith was the lone survivor. So the three of us were put in the back of one of our jeeps and taken into Cambodia, the neighboring country. And then we stopped in the middle of the road, got out, and got on these little trails. So for the next several days, we got on what we call the Ho Chi Minh Trails. And I describe them kind of like a spider web. You know, they're about, you know, maybe 12 inches, 9 inches wide. They crisscross, turn. You can't get off these trails because it's triple canopy jungle. And triple canopy jungle is you can't see them here at the back of the wall. It is that thick. And so they would move us during the night and let us rest during the day because in 72, President Richard Nixon was taking 10,000 troops out of Vietnam uh, a month. And we had about 180,000 soldiers at that time remaining in Vietnam. So they went to great lengths to capture us, to treat us as, quote, humanely as possible. 
And so they finally moved us after several days to a temporary camp. We had a Frenchman that was with us, Mick Damone, who stayed behind after we left that camp. They released him about 30 days later. And so after a couple of days, we got to our permanent camp. And they uh, put us in some hammocks and some tree lines outside of a fence. We could figure out that what that fence was until the next day. That's where they were keeping other Americans inside because we could see tops of heads, but we weren't quite sure. The next day, they moved us in. And as I walked into this camp, there's five tiger cages, five by six. And so they put me in one cage. And they put the two other guys with me, Carlson and uh, uh, Smith, in a cage to themselves. And then they put a 10-foot chain around one of my ankles and locked the other into the cage itself. Guarded 24-7 by a kid uh, 16, 15, 16, 17 years of age with an AK-47. And so I decided a couple days earlier, number one, I'm just glad to be alive because I should have been dead. Number two, I didn't know how long I was going to have to stay there. How long was this war going to last? Was I going to come home? Was I going to die? I didn't know. But you know what? I just had something inside of me that said, it's going to be okay. It's like when they first captured me and I walked out and was captured by the enemy. Now, I'd fought against these guys for 19 months. Now I'm fixing to live with them, if you will, for another 9 to 10 months. And, but I can remember walking out that camp when I was captured in a low cloud overhang because all the fighting had moved to the south. They had achieved their mission and taken our position. After three days, they were going to Saigon. At least that was their goal. They were stopped at the next village after 30 days. And I just felt a peace. And so I knew, and almost on a daily basis, that I was going to go home. I didn't know when, how, when, where, or anything like that. I just had that inner feeling. And so they would uh, lock us up at night in these cages during the day you know the the guy that spoke English that was kind of in charge of us you know may speak uh, a little Vietnamese but uh, he spoke English well enough where he could communicate with us and us with him he said you know when you're supposed to come in and outside the cage I called it a mother may I game but you're supposed to say to the liberation fire because they thought they were liberating you know the south Vietnamese from the American aggressors and so, you know, play this little game, you know, may I come out, may I go in, you know, and then when they came to your uh, uh, cage to bring you food, uh, you had to stand up and bow and all this stuff. And I've got here uh, on the table for you all to look at later on, they allowed us to bring back my bowl. This is the water bowl that they fill, fill, uh, filled three times a day. If we ran out, we didn't get until the next time. This was our food bowl filled with rice, a couple pieces of pork fat, about the size of a quarter, six of inch meat, still had the hair on it that we had three times a day. And then these are the chopsticks that are made out of bamboo. Now let me describe these cages because it's almost like an education in itself. And you say, how can people live like this? Because the cages were made all of bamboo trees. There was no nail hinges, bore little holes in them, you know, some of them put plugs in them and so forth. And that's how they assembled these things. And of course, except for the chains, which were metal, that was all there was. And so, you know, they fed us three times a day. Uh, they give us meaningful tasks like taking corn off the cob, making leaves to put on our roofs for shingles because of the monsoon season over there. And then they would give us some propaganda material to read. And one of the booklets they gave me to read was depicted uh, or described some battles that I'd actually been at. And so the first time they called me out to... Uh, be uh, uh, questioned, interrogated by one of their people. This guy comes out and sits down at this table. I'm sitting on this little tree stump, which is an exercise. I won't go into a lot of detail how I got down on this little tree stump, but as soon as I sat down, this guy comes out from the side. And he's sitting at this little makeshift table in a chair, and I'm having to look up at him. Automatically, I figure out he's got the superior position because I'm having to look up, not down or equal. So we go through this uh, hour or so interrogation, you know, the little mother may I games, you know, name, rank, serial number, and all this kind of stuff. And by the Geneva Conventions, you're only supposed to give name, rank, serial number. And so you try to be evasive uh, with, with your answers or misleading your answers and so forth. And they say, well, okay, now were you with this unit, this unit, this unit, and this unit? And this went on for, you know, five or ten minutes. I say, this guy, not that I was giving him anything that was current or accurate, knows his history. And so he said, you know, someday you may be able to go home free, so forth, but, you know, right now the war is going on and, and so forth. And then we get to uh, 
uh, the material that they'd uh, given us to read. And I said, I've got to disagree with a couple of the things in, in, in your little pamphlet here, guy. Now, I'm 25. I'm a little cocky, but I'm in no position to be cocky. But I'm thinking a lot of this stuff in my mind. And I said, some of these battles where you, you say you guys win, you didn't. We won. And he looks at me in all seriousness and says, oh, no, you've been misled by that propaganda machine that we've got in this country called the free press. And I say to myself, you've got to be kidding me. But as they told us more than once, they believe communist, communism. If you say something, even if it's fault, after a thousand and one times of repeating it, it becomes true. The whole system is based on lies. So we had this nice little encounter after about an hour and go back. And then every afternoon after the locks, I called a siesta time after, uh, after lunch and everything. That it's about, and this little guy runs in. He, he was so proud. You know, he was on this little transistor radio in the middle of the camp. At, you know, at the time, at the end, uh, there were seven of us in the camp. The only Marine, 17 Marines that were uh, caught, uh, captured in Vietnam, one of them was in our camp, James Walsh. Uh, the voice of Vietnam, and of course, you can imagine it was all one sided. They talked about how they were annihilating the troops, how a guy named George McGovern was going to win, hands down, the 1972 presidential race against uh, Richard Nixon. McGovern, I think, carried three states, and one of them wasn't his own, but again, it's all perpetrated on lies. And, uh, you know, there was some, uh, some talk from guys that are up in North Vietnam now. Cambodia, not many people know we were in Cambodia. There was three camps in Cambodia. And so uh, uh, three different camps. We didn't know about the other two camps until two days prior to our release. But most of the guys, even though people like Floyd Thompson, the longest held POW in Vietnam, nine years, five years in solitary confinement, special forces was taken over time up to North Vietnam. So everyone that saw the POW, know about the POW release uh, from Vietnam, thinks it all came out of North Vietnam, which it did, except for 27 of us. And so, uh, you know, they, you know, there were some guys up north that, you know, said some things, Americans said some things on the radio that they shouldn't have and so forth, but uh, that was dealt with after we got back. But uh, uh, we listened to that, you know, and, and people said, well, what'd you do? Well, you know, every 10 days they, you know, come and get us either in onesies or twosies and take us down to the stream, take water out of the stream and put in this little trough and we'd bathe and wash our uh, uniforms. I brought one uh, set of pajamas that I wore, we called them pajamas. Uh, so we always had an extra set. I've got some sandals here uh, that I wore because they wanted us to look good to the American public because they always said they're humane and lenient people. And so prior to our release, they gave us new pajamas, new sandals. So they knew that the press was going to be kind of, you know, following us and, and, and stuff like that. And so when we got off those airplanes, they said, well, look, we've taken good care of your American POWs. You know, we're humane and lenient people until the story started coming out to the contrary. So then they said that uh, uh, we, they moved us about 30 days prior to our release to a brand new camp. Now, according to the Paris Peace Agreements, which were signed in January of 1973, they were supposed to be out of Cambodia within 60 days. Now, I've described our camp, so to speak, in the, in the tiger cages and what they're made of, a little guard stand in the middle. Uh, one of the things I feared the most was snakes. I hadn't been there probably but about four or five days, and I'm lying there in, in, in my, inside my cage, and I see this thing moving on the outside of the cage, and I slowly turn my head, it's a black cobra snake. And so I call the guard, and he comes running over, of course the snake was nowhere to be found. But they had some of the most venomous snakes in the world. I was more afraid of dying of snake bite than our own Air Force bombing around our camp periodically, which confirmed us they knew where we were, they just couldn't get to us in Cambodia. We tried, you know, we thought about escaping, but inside the fence line was punji stakes, which are kind of like sharp, long uh, sticks with the points. You couldn't go through that way. I did meet a guy in Washington, D.C. when President Nixon had us up there at the White House in 73 of May, James Sexton, because periodically they would release, release an American for no reason per se. I'd say, well, maybe we release you. Uh, you'll go back and say, you know, well, these are good people. You know, they're just trying to, you know, defend the war, you know, fight the war from their uh, perspective and really humane people and so forth. Guy's name is James Sexton. And he happened to be in the same camp and he talked about how he escaped. I said, James, how did you, one, get off the chain that's locked around your ankles 24-7? And then, if you were that lucky, how'd you get out? Because you got bungee stakes inside the bamboo fence line. 
Well, when they captured him, he was wearing a retainer. Every night, he'd whittle on that chain link until one of the links broke. Now, keep in mind, we're in the jungles of Cambodia, Triple Canopy, Ho Chi Minh trails, so he's able to escape during the night, even though the guard's there, but you know, there's no light, until they come around with a little lantern, wake you up, make sure you're in your, in your, uh, in your uh, hammock. And he escaped out one side of the camp. And about an hour later, he came back in on the other side because he thought he was on the right trail, but it took him back to the camp on the other side. So that confirmed to us that I'm glad we, you know, uh, uh, we didn't try that little exercise. It may have been uh, futile, but, uh, you know, so they moved us to this new camp, and they said, well, the, the, the well is uh, running dry, and, you know, we had to build a new camp, so forth and so on. And so uh, in, I think it was October 72, there was a big announcement on the radio that, you know, peace is at hand. They're meeting in Paris, and uh, maybe the war's going to be over with soon. Of course, that quickly passed because one of the problems or issues they had, they couldn't agree. All parties couldn't agree on the size and shape of the table. Just sit down at a carpet table and let's hammer this out like we ought to be doing in Washington, D.C. today. But... So then, and finally, they signed the peace agreements, and then they allowed us want the chains to come off. They moved us, uh, allowed us to move to other camps or to the other cages. There was three in this uh, 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 second camp. And the holidays, they were very sensitive to the holidays. You know, at Christmas, Thanksgiving, they showed up. You thought McDonald's had arrived. You know, we'd be eating rice and pork fat, little uh, vegetables in season. I had my first and only hard-boiled egg. It's amazing what you will eat when there's nothing else on the menu. But... You know, they bring us, well, you know, it's special time, you know, wish you were your family, we wish you were our families, and, you know, play the little sympathy game and so forth. And then, uh, uh, so we went through two of those session, seasons of Thanksgiving and, and Christmas. And then they said, okay, pack up your stuff, you're moving, you're going to be released. They uh, load up our stuff. I've got a plastic water bag here that we put all our personal worldly possessions in at that time and uh, went back into uh, Vietnam. And David, if you can show that next slide on the, at the truck, I think. And so we get out there. Two days prior to release, I'm at the same spot. They drop us at the same spot where I was captured locked in because it's got an airstrip there that Bill McLemore helped build. And so we're sitting there at 8 o'clock in the morning. We hear this helicopter sound coming in over the South Ridge line. And they come in. It's a pretty sight we've seen in almost a year. They, they land over on the far side, six choppers. No machine guns. If you know about you know, military uh, helicopters, they've got the door guns and all this stuff. No public display of that information or, or uh, equipment. And so the helicopters land. We sat there. We sat there. We sat there. And then the truck started up, and we turned around and go back to where they'd been holding us for the previous two days. What had happened is some of the North Vietnamese prisoners that were being held by the South Vietnamese government did not want to go back. I can understand why. But the North Vietnamese said, we don't get our guys back, you don't get the Americans. So about eight hours later, about five o'clock that afternoon, we get back on the Deuce and Aft truck, which is one of our trucks, which is now in their uh, possession, and they take us back out there. And this truck is 27 of us getting off the truck. And I'm the guy in the middle holding the bag uh, right there uh, uh, getting off that truck and then we went over and <sighs> met our, our, our uh, welcome party, our, our rescue party and went through the process of identifying ourselves you know, and all that kind of stuff and about an hour later we got on the helicopters and the colonel told us that was on our chopper that was head of the pickup operation. He said we weren't going to leave without you guys. We weren't supposed to have any public display of armament, but I guarantee you, we weren't going to be leaving. We were ready. So we get to Saigon, and I land. I don't know, Dave. Do we have a pic next picture? I know that you know that's okay. This is a close-up. Me here in the center. Uh, a couple of guys that were in my camp uh, right before we got on the helicopters. And David, what's the next one? Okay, I'll get to this one in a second. So we get to Saigon. And we get off the, uh, the helicopters, and here's this red carpet. We thought, what is all this about? You know, we just want to get home. Well, here's all the ambassadors and the generals and the admirals, and it was a welcome line. And, you know, we go to the red carpet and get on this freedom bird, as we call it, and head to Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. 
And because our release had been delayed eight hours that day, the first plane load coming out of North Vietnam, is supposed to be a simultaneous release, North Vietnam, South Vietnam, was because our release was held up, the guys coming out of North Vietnam got there first to Clark Air Force Base. And so I'm getting off the airplane with George Wannett, Army captain from Connecticut. And I see all these people on the flight line. I said, this is unbelievable. Because we had sat around talking to you know, them before. How are we going to go home? Are they going to give us airplane tickets? Are we going home on a boat? You know, we had no idea what was fixing to take place. And I'm pointing to George. I said, look at all these people out here to see us. And so we spent a couple of days at uh, Clark Air Force Base and then uh, got on the airplane and uh, uh, like it says in, in my deal, I was one of the first two Texans back, and uh, Mrs. Lyndon Johnson, President Johnson's wife, was kind enough to let us use the presidential suite at uh, Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio. The people that took care of us took care of the president, so uh, it was very emotional uh, uh, time to not only be in the presidential suite, uh, the medical doctor, head of the, uh, Colonel Wells was President Johnson's military doctor and stuff like that, but... Uh, it's an experience, needless to say, if you haven't gathered already, it literally changed my life. And as best as I try to describe that experience with the time we've got left, or we've had here today, uh, Dave Baker, the Air Force, who became a one-star general, and died about three years ago, put together in words what it was really all about and how we felt. And I'd like to share that with you. In this camp, there are seven men all of whom Uncle Sam did send to Vietnam to fight, he said, so others can decide how they want to be led. Gladly we went, but alas for us, we are captured in the heat, battle, and dust, taken away from our families out of the war, then chained to a cage. Life is really a bore. We are Army, Air Force, and Marine, and all of us are ready to scream about the inhumane treatment and care the Viet Cong called lenient and fair. As prisoners of war, we eat pork, fat, and rice, but we think of steak and other things nice. Our minds seem to dwell in the future and past. Oh, how long can this war last? I know that someday we will all be set free, but only the good Lord knows when that will be. The United States, friends and wives, surely be the happiest day of our lives. And until that great and eventful day, we must all stick together and pray and give thanks to God for being alive, for surely it was he who let us survive. We'll be a little older, but much more wise, and I don't mean from listening to communist lies. If there's one thing upon which seven men can agree, that one thing is, freedom is not free. And I would be remiss if I did mention not Vietnam, but all wars. Guys, there are guys that never came home. There are guys that were alive as POWs in Vietnam that never came home. There are families today, whether it be Korea, World War II Korea, Vietnam, and even the more recent campaigns, hopefully there's not, but just a couple, all they ever wanted was the loved one's remains returned. Nothing more, nothing less. But I tell you what, you know, people you know, have said some nice things about us all, all these years and so forth. President Nixon, like I said, had us to the White House, largest sit-down dinner in the history of the White House, which was quite an honor. Again, we didn't expect all the stuff that was given to us. We just wanted to come home and get on with life. But the real heroes are not people like myself and some other decorated, Vietnam, or ve decorated veterans. It's those that have paid the ultimate sacrifice on faraway battlefields all over this globe that are the real heroes, in my opinion, today. And as we look forward to Veterans Day this Monday, I hope each and every one of us can take a moment to remember those that have served, and even importantly, those that are serving today. Because the draft ended in 1975. Several of you all here entered the military since the draft stopped. People like major newly promoted James Crabtree have served voluntarily because they are patriotic. They believe in this great country of ours. Right, wrong, or indifferent. You know, it's when, unfortunately, uh, you know, when the Nixon resignation was going on, 
you know, a lot of people said, you know, gosh, you can have a change under those conditions of the highest office in the world. And the next day, it's business as usual. Only in America can these kind of things happen. But anyway, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for indulging me. And if we've got a couple of minutes, James, uh, any questions people might have, I'll be glad to answer that. Uh, but otherwise, I've got you know some of my stuff up here. Certainly come and take a look at that. But again, thank you. Yes, sir. Dave? Mark? Well, I probably overlooked that. Med medical treatment was a little lacking, Mark, uh, for some reason. <laughs> Just like McDonald's, I couldn't order out or, you know, Internet, you know, Angela, my order in and have it delivered and stuff like that. But uh, because I, I had 17 wounds, some of them were more severe than the others, uh, you know, I was concerned about dying from infection. Uh, one of the things I declined because I had negative experience as a child was penicillin. Uh, and so they offered me, I said, nope, I know what could happen if I take it, knowing that I have an earlier reaction to a negative reaction. So I said, God, you brought me here this far. I'm going to trust you. So the guy would come in initially and look at my wounds. The most severe were in my legs and so forth. And kind of want to put an iodine solution on, watered down solution on it and bandage them up. Now over there in that part of the world, they don't believe in stitching the wounds. They let them heal from the inside out. And I was a little concerned about infection. But after about two months, you know, the wounds healed. But no, really, there. And I'm not sure this guy even knew what end of a syringe he the hole. I'm glad he didn't bring one trying to, you know, administer something to me. But no, sir. Thank you all so much. God bless.